word of God. The incense that goes to heaven are the sweet prayer of the saints, but they have to be mingled with the precious blood of Jesus. Christ is our intercessor. Our prayer would only return on the earth as dust if we wouldn't have a mediator in the sanctuary. And of course, in the most holy, where Christ is right now since 1844, performing the judgment of the dead, and soon no man knows when the judgment of the living will start. The sign for the judgment of the living is the Sunday law in the United States, and I'm persuaded this still stands. So as we see now the sanctuary and what it means for us to understand the sanctuary, I hope that it gives you a bit of a difference in perspective of the value that the blood of Christ, what it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, which was in the most holy place, in the Ark of the Covenant, did not cancel the sin. It was to remain indirect on the record in the sanctuary until the great day of atonement. And yes, the holy and the most holy represent the heavenly sanctuary. And yes, there is blood in the sanctuary and it needs cleansing. It needs cleansing at the level of the court, the holy and the most holy, but the holy and the most holy is where the blood is right now in the most holy, especially when the Lord is finishing the work there. So people who refuse to believe that there was blood and there was actually sin represented by the blood there and the blood of the lamb representing Christ that bears it, that's what the sanctuary teaches. And as we see, it needs cleansing and that was done under the Great Day of Atonement. I do not know if the blood has been removed from the earth yet or from the holy or the most holy. What I know is it will be finished soon when the first plague falls. When Michael stands up, Daniel 12, verse 1, and he comes out of the most holy never to go back, there is no more mediation, no more opportunity to confess and, re and repent. We need to teach this right now as we see the sign approaching. This is our duty as Seventh-day Adventist teacher. So now as we have seen in the sanctuary, the purpose of Christ is to show us that we can stop sinning. No sinner that did not repent it could come to even the court. And no blood could be put on the altar of incense or in the most holy on the day of atonement if the sinner was an active sinner, if his sin was still with him. Sin that is shown to the character of God to his law. So, in order to understand now better what is that all entailing, I'm going to go now to the second part of, this is actually the third part, but another area of what we're accused of. We have been accused that we're teaching that Christ's nature was perfect, and it is possible for us to be perfect before his return. So what I would like to touch on right now is how was Christ's mind perfect? And I want to show it to you from a point of view that perhaps you have never heard of, but I believe that it's quite simple to understand. So this is the mind as we understand it from the Word of God. From Paul, we understand that man's has two nature, an outward nature and an inward nature. Man has a nature that is basically his inner mind, his inner thought, but he's also influenced by the outside thought. And these outside influence or thought or circumstances does influence the inside of his mind. So now I'm going to take it step by step and show you the mind of Christ. When Christ came on this earth, I know the Catholic Church and Protestant Church claim that he came with the nature of Adam before sin. Well, there is a problem with that, because if he came with the nature of Adam before sin, he could not be like us. And people could use that against him, that he had an advantage over us. But Christ was 100% divine, 100% human. This is a mystery, again, that is difficult to understand. But as Christ was divine and human, we must also understand that his human nature was with a perfect mind. 
So that's why when we talk about the nature of Christ and we make it like ours, we cannot really do that either. Christ was like us. He had two nature, and I hope I'm going to make it clear. Remember I told you Adam and Eve, they sinned through their eyes, their ears, their nose, their mouth, and their hands. They touched, they smelled, they heard, and they gave away to the temptation. <clears throat> now, I want to show you how we sin. Turn with me now to the book of James, and it's the first chapter of James, which is very easy to find, just after Hebrew, and I want to show you how we sin. And once we understand how we sin, hopefully you will understand why Christ did not sin. And that will help us. Now, let's turn to James chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 12, 13, 14, 15. Blessed is the man that endured temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. So, there is blessing into temptation, we are told here in the word. Next verse. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And I'm going to stop here. Now, you may think that this is very complicated, but it's not. What you need to understand is how the mind functions. And this is something that most people do not know. I think what I'll do for the sake of maybe easier show, we'll put it right here. Perhaps it will be clearer. All right. So we can see all what we have here. What we have here is actually showing how the mind functions. This is the perfect mind of Christ. We're praying and asking the Lord to give us his mind. Doesn't it say in the word of God, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus? The Bible does not make any promises that God cannot fulfill. Do you agree with that? Everybody that reads the word of God and claims the promises of God can be assured that God fulfilled his promises. So here we have it. So listen carefully. This is the mind, the way the mind functions. The mind is enticed by the outside world since Genesis 3. To taste, to the touch, to the hearing, to the sight, and to the smell, we are enticed constantly. And before I go any further, if you allow me, I'm going to put another picture here. And I think you can see it well here. This is the brain. So that will make you understand better because the mind, it's seat in the brain. It's not floating around. And the mind is spiritual, so it's not something that the surgeon can come and he says, I'm going to operate on the mind. When they operate, they operate on the brain. And the mind basically sits in the frontal lobe. Okay, so this is where the mind, where the character is, where the quality of character is. And it sits in the frontal lobe. Now, there is two mind, I have two brain, I know that. There is the frontal lobe and there is the midbrain here, and I'm going to show you which one is which? According to this, the intellect, the conscience, and the reason sits in the frontal lobe. That's where the mind is. The intellect, the conscience, and the reason. Now, here is where the passion, the appetite, and the desire sits. Passion, appetite, desire. Why? I'll tell you why. The frontal lobe, the whole brain actually, has 12 pair of brain nerves. People say millions and billions. It has millions of brain cells, but it has only 12 pair or 24 brain nerves. 12 on the right side and 12 on the left. And those brain nerves are attached to what? They're attached to your senses. So through your eyes and your ears and your nose and your mouth and your hand, this is where it's attached. It gives you the sense of touch, the sense of hearing, the sense of, uh, sorry, hearing and seeing and smelling and touching, like uh, with the mouth, tasting. So these are the five senses which are related to the 12 pairs of the brain nerves. Now, we have also 31 pairs of body nerves, and these body nerves basically are related to your spinal cord and they divide and they attach to all your organs. The brain nerve 
12 pair or 24, the body nerve, 31 pair or 62, which makes it 86 nerve only. Don't let anybody get on your nerve now. Only 86 nerve we have. So basically, we have the 12 pair of brain nerves, which gives their order to the body nerve, which give the order to our organs. And that's how the body functions. Very simply, I'm talking to you about anatomy and physiology here. When pathology comes in, when we're sick, there could be many reasons and many factors, but many factors also depends on your brain nerve, the way you protect your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, your touch. Because we know that the brain nerve, which communicate with the whole system, are the only medium to which heaven communicate with us and affect our inmost life. So the brain nerve that connect with all the system, we have element system in the body, these brain nerve are the only medium to which heaven communicate with us. So heaven communicate with our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth, and our touch. And it all depends to whom you lay your will to. The altar of burnt offering is where you lay the will. And this is where you choose who you should serve today. If today you choose to drink and smoke and carouse and do whatever is against God's character, you have chosen another master, just like Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. But if willingly this morning you got up and you read your Bible and you drank your water to clear your brain and your body before you start a new day, notice I talk physically and spiritually here because they go in in hand, then you will know that your brain nerves are communicated by God. They're, he's sending you some signal where you can understand and apply these things from the word that you read and from the things that you absorb into your mind. God can speak to you. But if during the day you allow your eyes to wander and your mind to wander or to hear things that are not proper or to smell or to taste or to touch things that are not proper, you have switched master. It's not very complicated. You cannot stay on the fence and say, I'm not going to choose any of them. You can't. If you don't choose your creator, automatically you have chosen the rebel leader. So this is what you need to know. This is the battle for the mind we're going through. And Christ had that mind. Christ had appetite, passion, and desire. So did Adam and Eve. But the difference in Genesis 1 and 2 is that Adam and Eve use their intellect, their conscience, and their reason to control their appetite, passion, and desire because for two chapters in the Bible, Adam and Eve were submitted to their maker. But in chapter 3, this is exactly what they did. And I'm going to turn this upside down because it's easier to understand. This is the way I teach it in the prison to drug addicts and alcoholics and people that are confused. They look at the board and they always say, Miss Odette, your card is upside down. And I, they think I've made a mistake. And I say, I know. This is the way we're born. This is the way we are before we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We are all upside down. From the little tiny baby to old grandpa and grandma who have not accepted Jesus as their personal savior. For the baby, he cannot accept it yet. But his parents are responsible to teach him the way to the Father through Jesus Christ and bring him in the way so that he learns to control his desire, passion, and appetite, which rules over his reason and conscience and intellect. This is the inheritance that we have obtained from Adam and Eve. We're all upside down. And if you don't believe me, just watch a little baby who doesn't get what he wants. He's at the store and he wants something. He's three years old or two years old. And he starts rolling on the floor and he starts doing all kind of temper tantrum because that's natural with him to do temper tantrum. So basically, he lets his passion and appetite and desire rule over his conscience, reason, and intellect. Of course, he's too little to know this. So that's why mom and dad, who know that, are supposed to explain it to him. Honey, you're not supposed to let, you tell a two years old that, you'll see what he's gonna react like. You're not supposed to let your passion, appetite, and desire rule over your reason, your conscience, and your intellect. And don't laugh. When I was small, my mother, because I was the oldest daughter of a family of children, 10 children, if I didn't want to wash the dishes or do something that I was supposed to do as um, oldest daughter, my mom would say, be reasonable. 
And you know what it did to me is I learned that I have to reason. She does, she knows that now, but I've told my mom, I says, that really helped me to stop going on my own feeling and reason things. A sister of mine, which is number seven in the group, she actually said that when my mom would tell her that, she would do twice as bad. She did not want to reason. And I thought it was very fascinating when she told me that because with me, it kind of brought me back. And I decided not to follow my own inclination. But with my sister, she just wanted to stay like this. So the submit your will to, this is what you're going to be. And it's very fascinating because Steps to Christ teaches that. And so are the 12 step of Alcoholic Anonymous and Al-Anon and Way of Life. This is the corporation that I have started that used the 12 step of AA. And it's a down call to Steps to Christ. The sinner who is in a sin and he wants to find a better way has to submit his will. He has to admit that he's powerless to manage his own life. He has to come to believe in a power greater than himself. And then he submit his will and his life to this power. Depending which power you choose, you see this? This is much bigger, isn't it, than the two other power. The will is what is controlling everything. And the fate combined with will is what will give you the choice that you're supposed to make. As long as your will is submitted to the wrong master, this is the way your mind's going to be. But once you submit to Christ, he starts working with you in your mind. And you learn little by little on a daily basis through his power that appetite, passion, and desire must always be under the control of conscience and reason and intellect. We will fall often into this journey. It's not easy because there is temptation along the way. But let me tell you something. You do not sin through your passion, appetite, and desire. You are tempted through it. And the devil, and we will see that in the next sessions, the devil knows that because in, Getsem sorry, in uh, the Garden of Eden, Gethsemane as well as another garden, in the Garden of Eden, that's how he took over Adam and Eve. He took over Adam and Eve to their brain nerves, to their connection with their senses. Remember? Five senses he took over them. She saw, she heard, she touched, she smelled, and she ate. I know it doesn't say in the book of Genesis 3 that she smelled, but I'm sure she smelled something, if it was a beautiful fruit, and she fell. And so did Adam. Us, one sense, and we can fall flat on our face because we're so weak after almost 6,000 years of sin. But the Lord had the same mind. He was tempted as we are, yet without sin. How was he tempted as we are, yet without sin? This is the answer. He was tempted to appetite, passion, and desire. Through his senses, at all times, he had to keep those senses pure. And at all times, he knew temptation would come on him, and he had to use the said Lord. And what he did, he watched his appetite, passion, and, and desire. He was tempted to be tired, to be discouraged, to be hungry. There is no big temptation of being hungry. There's a temptation in overeating. But Christ was tempted as we are. Believe me, he was, yet without sin. This is where we sin. We sin with the intellect, the conscience, and the reason.